my wife would say, you have a dirty mind. Now, you have disproved her by inviting me to be with all these beautiful minds. So, I'm going to talk about saving nature in a world that's increasingly getting human modified, coming under tremendous pressures, and why we should value nature. A set of values, uh, when I say nature, I don't mean dogs, I don't mean cats that we have around us. I mean unmodified systems, plants, animals, communities that function in terms of uh, regulation and energy transfer. So that kind of nature. Now, why, we should, why should we value this? There's a whole set of reasons saying it's ethical, we owe it to the world and the future generations. We have no right to destroy. Aesthetic, these are beautiful. It takes millions of years to create a magnificent pheasant. We can't wipe it out. There are spiritual, say that I gaze at that banyan tree, I get wisdom. Now, I'm not going into that. I'm not saying it's unimportant, but in this talk, I'm not going to cover that part of value of saving nature. I'm going to talk more about the, to begin the talk by talk, when I say value, more about the utility of nature as opposed to hugely human modified landscapes that we have increasingly dominated around the world. The utility of nature was increased. It's become more and more important as nature has shrunk. Appreciation of that has gained currency in the society at large as nature has shrunk. Initially, we didn't do that. So today we realize that there's tremendous utility for human welfare in terms of provision of foods, fibers, drugs, chemicals, and even fuels in a post-petroleum future. In fact, the petroleum that we use and which drives the complete economy and energy needs of the earth is just old plants, 200 million old, old plants that are buried under the ground. So this is certainly, this is increasingly realized, particularly in the last 50 to 100 years as we have run out of these resources. We now recognize that unmodified natural ecosystems have ecosystem functions. They regulate stream flows, they might mitigate local climates, and a lot of our ability to live off this nature, uh, harvest its products, comes from their integrity. So these ecosystem services are another reason why we value nature. The third one is what my former boss, Dr. William Conway, at the Wildlife Conservation Society used to call nature's ability to surprise us. Natural evolution has taken billions of years. There are designs in there, there are systems in there that we haven't even understood at the beginning. How the wing beats of a beetle. Aerodynamic understanding of that phenomena is still not complete. So there is tremendous amount of design and codes written in there that we are wiping out without even knowing what it is. We are all very proud, we are writing millions of lines of code sitting here in Bangalore while Billions of lines of code are getting wiped out for the most trivial reasons within 200 kilometers of us. This value of nature we haven't grasped. So, in a sense, when people started arguing for nature conservation, one of the early thinkers, this is a new argument. See, these three, four arguments I put forward are basically about utility, but in an ecosystem sense, in a biodiversity product sense, or in terms of some designs that we can use in the future. But now, as we face the global warming crisis, this crisis of horrendous proportions, which human society has never faced before and has never been equipped to deal with, even with all our nine forms of intelligence. Now, this, there is an interesting story to this. Till the 1960s, biological evolution, that is selection, natural selection, etc., how organisms evolve, was thought to be unconnected to other cycles of the earth, the geology, the chemistry of the earth, the streams, the climate, there was no link. In fact, geology drove everything and biology was in some sense consequential. 1963, two great minds, James Lovelock and Lynn Margolis proposed what they called the Gaia hypothesis. Of course, they gave a kind of a Bambi name to it, mother goddess kind of, didn't get treated seriously in the beginning. What they proposed was that biological in evolution also in turn influences these geologic or climatic events. And they showed 200 million ago, arrival of microbes on Earth. Since then, interaction between those early organisms and the abiotic environment 
has maintained homeostasis through a feedback process that had made life possible on Earth. The original life, which of course, as Edwin Schrodinger pointed out, comes out of chemistry. But once life was created in the form of microbes, it started expanding and evolving and shaping the environment in a broader sense of making Earth livable for, uh, or changing the Earth's climate in a manner that supported life. Now, Lovelock was initially scorned, particularly by biologists like me, evolutionary biologists laughed at him, saying, oh, no, they can't be. But the climate scientists took him more seriously. And as we have gathered knowledge now, it's become clear, particularly gives a nice exposition in the recent book, Revenge of the Gaia, that what we call standard Earth system sciences is now pretty much what was proposed as Gaia. So, if we continue to modify the Earth through human activities the way do, we do, we are dooming ourselves. So it's not any doomsday scenario anymore. It's very solidly become main, mainstream Earth system science. Again, all these, so Lovelock basically argues that we need to take back nature over large parts of the Earth. And there's an analogy that another great uh, population ecologist Paul Ehrlich gives about what we are doing to natural ecosystems.